thank you um yeah so uh, has who who here has heard of confidential containers or confidential compute before wow quite a few people okay cool cool i mean we'll we'll go through like all, all of it but uh, yeah i just wanted to know so uh, here um you know i'm i'm suraj deshmukh i'm a software engineer at microsoft i work on the confidential containers project and yeah today although microsoft sponsored this uh, travel and everything but i'm representing the project here today so anyways uh we'll, we'll like yeah it's a packed agenda today we'll we'll look at what isolation is what confidential computing is then attestation containers and all of that but uh yeah we'll try to go through all of this in 30 minutes but if not i'll i'll at least try the left side of it you know okay so uh like yeah what what comes to mind when we say isolation any 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 words anything on cloud in context of cloud what virtual machines yeah sorry say it again yeah in ability to affect others yeah yeah that, that that's i mean that's the that's why platform owners or cloud providers have isolation right they want to protect their other customers from uh, you know uh, from 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 the hostile customers or somebody getting uh, access to their uh, machines or whatever so it's 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 very much a platform owners bias so when i say platform owner as in any cloud provider or who is whoever is providing you hardware to run your application they also want to you know uh, contain that container or application or function whatever it is in its in its that enclave uh, the way it looks like right and uh, of course they want to do bin packing and all, all those good good stuff for to 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 extract the maximum efficiency so uh, typically the isolation looks like you have this uh, whatever cloud provider has this uh, you know infrastructure uh, you may have orchestrator or you are using plain vms and this is where uh, app pod vm whatever function it comes in and the red line is what isolation boundary looks like right and then you can get data or application inside it so that's isolation like nobody can get out of the red boundary on the orchestrator level or the infrastructure level uh, i mean not in absolute terms people can get out i mean if they find some cv or whatever but like that's the idea of isolation uh, the platform is trying to restrict whatever is inside uh, to not come outside but what about the outsiders like what about the whoever is owning the orchestrator or whoever owns the infrastructure they can still see it i mean although they promise that they want but they still have the capability of seeing what's inside right uh, as in like what's inside as in what application you are running even if your data is encrypted or whatever they might not see that but they can still see inside like they can do a memory dump or whatever so uh, that that's where isolation has this whole you know uh, i mean it doesn't it doesn't affect the app owners concern it's the platform owners what they are addressing here uh, they want so what what if if you want to like you know keep the uh, platform owner outside that you don't want them to you know come on, come inside how do you do that um so yeah so what's the what's the technical feasibility of it how do you you know keep uh, platforms out of your trust boundary how do you uh, like for for some paranoid users who you know cannot uh, cannot risk losing their data especially if they are uh, they are dealing with some uh, you know uh, personally identifying viable information they want to they 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 don't i mean they cannot risk losing data even accidentally or whatever uh, so how do you uh, so because of that fear they never come to uh, uh, to to cloud they they choose to remain on prem and uh, Uh, that's why they lose on the innovations of uh, cloud so okay so how how do you solve that so uh, i guess that's where confidential computing comes in so before we go into confidential computing let's let's look at what confidentiality is by the way uh, the uh, the the image that you see like here you can see there are locks on these doors so it's a way of you know uh, showing isolation that uh, nobody can come out <laughs> because it's locked from outside um and yeah so co confidentiality it's it's in the contrast with uh, uh, isolation uh, i won't say exactly opposite but you know it's uh, addressing the concern of app owner so uh, confidentiality keeps uh, the other apps users platforms uh, from looking into what you are doing inside inside your application so for a paranoid user uh, they can they can you know they can still 
start using this. Uh, 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 it's it's for for addressing the paranoid users so that they can come to public clouds and you know uh, also get the elasticity of cloud. And so yeah, I, I got this image uh, using AI, which which shows like a latch, like an old style latch, which you can you know put from inside and nobody can open it from outside. So it's it's kind of signifying that. Uh, I guess, but that that's the only, this is where the analogy between confidentiality and isolation ends. So yeah, anyways, moving on. So we saw this with this, this thing before isolation and that's where confidentiality comes in. Like it's, it's blocking outsiders from coming in. So uh, like, taking a closer look, like, right? Like what's confidential compute? So traditionally what happens is uh, the basic premise is protecting data in use. So Generally, when you are today, when you are doing any processing, like data is decrypted or it's, it's in plain text when it's being processed. In memory, it's in plain text. So if somebody has access to your uh, underlying uh, host operating system, they can do a memory dump and see what's, what's running in those VMs. They could like decode it. I mean, it's, it's, it's not hard to understand what secrets look like, right? You, if you have a good enough regex, you can uh, decode binary to, 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 to those secrets. So uh, if, if somebody has it, has the access to the underlying machine, they can, they can see it. But with confidential compute, the processor knows, uh, processor encrypts and decrypts the data. It knows how to encrypt and decrypt it. It has keys and, uh, uh, and nobody else, if, even if they get access to that, uh, you know, underlying machine, underlying uh, host, and they do a memory dump, they can't see anything. And uh, so basically the, compu the, uh, the computation happens in an enclave, which is supported by hardware, as in by the CPU. Uh, it, it prevents any unauthorized access or, uh, to apps or data, both. Uh, so today, what the, what's the state of data encryption, right? Like we have, we have solved this problem of uh, storing data when uh, uh, storing data encrypted. There are so many solutions out there. Like almost every storage provider has some, some, some uh, support of it. We have solved uh, encryption in transit with SSL. Like, I mean, I don't think anybody sends data unencrypted over the internet today. So, and, and, but this is the last frontier where data was unencrypted. It was when it is being processed and it's stored in memory, it's, it's un unencrypted, unencrypted. So uh, this is where confidential compute like, has this final, uh, cover, like, it got you covered with, uh, with encryption while, while the data is being uh, used. So um, yeah, so how, how do you use confidential compute, right? So this technology is available in two, two forms, like you can encrypt processes memory and you can also encrypt VM memory. So, but, but most widely used is the virtual machine uh, memory encryption because it's easier, it enables lift and shift. Uh, with processes, uh, like Intel came with the technology first, but then you needed special SDKs uh, to encrypt the memory and use it. And, but like, you know, you had to change your, uh, like developers had to change their like, development pattern, which obviously they don't like it. So, so VM became popular because it's lift, it enables lift and shift. You bring your application as is and start using in VM and you get the encrypted memory. So yeah, so what are the various offerings that exist? Like AMD has this uh, technology called secure encrypted virtualization and secure nested paging, SEVSNP. Uh, it's available on uh, Azure AWS GCP. Uh, this is a new technology from Intel Trusted Domain Extensions. It's uh, uh, it's, it's, it's in a private preview on uh, Azure. Uh, Arm also has their own offering. I, I'm not sure where it's offered today. And NVIDIA uh, also came with confidential GPUs. So even when you're training your uh, models, you can have your data encrypted. Um, so yeah, uh, like I said, like this, all, all, all this happens transparently. Apps don't have to worry about how the encryption is going on behind the scene. Uh, processor does it. Uh, that's what enables the lift and shift, mo uh, lift and shift model. And and if we talk about uh, uh, AMD's case specifically, so every time a new VM is created, new virtual machine is, uh, and confidential virtual machine is created, it generates a private key uh, for, for that virtual machine, a unique private key. So even if like or from whatever mechanism somebody gets access to those private keys, they can, they can you know, uh, they'll only have access for that one particular machine. So yeah, uh, any questions so far? Uh, 
I can take questions, yeah. Go ahead. Like uh, performance overhead? Yeah, yeah. The, so we, we'll, we'll see in drawbacks, but I can quickly. So the question was, is there a, a like yeah penalty on encryption decryption? So yes, uh, like one of the drawbacks of confidential compute is like you will see some performance overhead compared to the regular computing because it's is there. Uh, but from the studies that have ha that have been done by uh, uh, Intel and AMD, uh, it has found that uh, it's it's around 10 percent or less than 10 percent. So yeah. Cool, uh, moving on. So um, a, like trusted compute base, right? Like the definition of trusted compute base is like these, uh, like whatever components are needed in computing system that gives you like a secure environment for operations, right? So the bigger the TCB, more problems you'll have. Uh, you have, you're exposing more yourself to, to various types of CVs and attacks. So in a, in a regular setup, what it looks like, right? Today's stack, you have hardware, you have BIOS firmware on it, your host kernel, host operating system, hypervisor, and then f that's where you come in. Like you're trusting this whole thing, like bottoms up. Uh, especially, like I mean, these internal components that that are provided by a platform, like you have to trust them. And when confidential computing comes in, you have this different hardware, so you can stop trusting everything that's in between. And obviously, like as a guest, you have to trust yourself. <laughs> but uh, yeah, these internal layer, internal uh, stack, you can uh, the intermediate stack, you can stop uh, trusting it. Th this is how it reduces the TCB and then uh, reduces your uh, exposure to various attacks. So, uh, what are the use cases, right? Like, uh, I mean, why would you not trust your cloud provider? Like, uh, so I think it's it's more than just cloud provider. Uh, this type of technology enables something called as multi-party computation, where uh, Two parties have different data they don't want to share with each other, and uh, they still want some environment to do their uh, computation. Uh, so multi especially in the AI world where uh, different people are coming with different models and they, they don't want to share with each other but still want to use, use each other's uh, uh, technology. The other thing is uh, obviously legal requirements, right? Like with uh, advanced uh, laws that are coming, at, uh, coming in around uh, personal information protection so this kind of gives organizations place to you know click uh, like check boxes <laughs> and uh, the next one is obviously like yeah will uh, protecting your uh, ip uh, especially around ai being like today's you know hyped uh, hype around ai so much so this technology gives you this additional uh, protection around whoever uh, uh, around unauthorized access so um, yeah, so we, we saw like yeah, the, the, like memory is encrypted, but how do you know like it's really encrypted? Like the cloud provider could be just emulating whatever you know, uh, whatever hypervisor calls. How do you really know uh, that it's encrypted? On uh, if you have if you own the underlying machine, you could do mem memory dump and see that oh it's it's really working. But that's not the case with cloud providers. You just get a VM. So uh, a hostile like how do you how do you really verify? So uh, yeah, that's where attestation comes in. So attestation, I guess, has been a uh, major talked about term even in this uh, supply chain security year two. Uh, attestation is important. Uh, so obviously, uh, attestation is about verifying uh, the trustworthiness of the environment that you are running in. And uh, so the so in this case, it's remote attestation. You are not doing like a local check because I mean there could be a possibility that they give you an altogether different operating system image emulating the same application that you are running and then you could just say, oh, this is good and then you, you move on. So that's not how it is. You need a remote attestation where you send, uh, where you send like uh, evidence that you gather locally. In this case, you talk to the processor, get evidence from the processor, send it to a remote entity. That entity knows how to do processing on it and then it gives you a or NAC and accordingly you can go forward. Uh, a lot of the efforts that are going on in supply chain security are about like Reactive processing, like you gather evidence and later if something goes wrong, you figure out what's wrong. Here it's proactive, you, you don't go ahead until you verify you are really in a, uh, until very attestation happens, you don't go forward because it's a risk. You, are, uh, you might be introducing or downloading data in an unsafe environment. Uh, so yeah, the, I think I talked about this remote, uh, remote setup that you have to have. We, we'll see how, like, like, like in a block diagram, how it looks like. 
So uh, remote attestation in a background check, like background check is a way of uh, how attestation is happening here. We'll see the other way as well. Let's say this is a node with confidential hardware. You bring up this VM or uh, trusted execution environment. And then whatever attestation tool you have in, inside that machine, this could be part of your boot process. It has to be part of your boot process because then if it fails, you don't go forward. Uh, it, it talks to the hardware, gathers evidence, sends to this remote entity called relying party. So these, these terms that you see, relying party and all, these are from, uh, from RFC. Uh, it's a IET, IETF RFC called RATS, R-A-T-S. Uh, it's a protocol that is being defined on how to do attestation, like a remote attestation in uh, confidential uh, computing. So yeah, it sends that evidence, and then relying party sends that to a verifier. This verifier has a logic on no, on decoding this, whatever evidence is. Generally, this, the, this, this package that you see is encrypted with a private key uh, of that hardware, and it can only be decrypted from the public key of AMD or Intel or whoever you're using. So once you can decrypt it, that means it was actually signed by or signed or encrypted by the real hardware. Nobody, can, nobody else can do that. So it, it, it either gives ACK or NAC. Now what happens after this is completely how you design this whole application deployment. Once you get an ACK, you can either just send out ACK or it's confidential and you go ahead and start processing or you can release something like a key uh, which you can use to decrypt data that you'll download later. Or I mean, the, use, the, the, the last step can be variable. It can be anything. But rest of it has to be, uh, you know, uh, you have to rely on it. The passport model is where, uh, it, like, all these components exit, it, uh, exist. It gets this evidence. Uh, it sends to a it sends to verify it directly. And then it gets a token, call it passport, like real passport. And then you can use this passport to any other relying party which can you know, use this passport to say, oh, you are really running in a, you are not spoofed, you are really running in a TE, and then I can give you key or whatever. So this is generally needed when you really want a key. So that's passport model. So um, yeah, uh, how, how is this technology coming to Kubernetes, right? Kubernetes world. Uh, so before we before we go into that, let's let's look at this puzzle, right? This this technology that we are talking about, it only runs in VMs, and uh, on the other hand, Kubernetes can start like Run C based uh, containers, right? Like it uses Linux technologies, C groups, whatever. Uh, so, but this is only in VMs. So how do you uh, how do you get this VMs to run with Kubernetes? So we need we need something that can marry these things together, right? Like VMs running as pods and Kubernetes. So I guess that's, that's where Kata containers comes in. So show of hands, who knows Kata container? Oh, who don't know Kata container? Okay, okay, quite a few. So, so Kata is a, is, a, is a container runtime that was started by, uh, I think, Intel. It's an open source project, and uh, it's, uh, it's part of the uh, Open Infra Foundation. And so the idea is that you can, it's, it's compatible, you can start containers similar to Run C, but it starts light with VMs behind the scene. So you have this, uh, this compatibility with, with Kubernetes, it, it understands CRI, and, uh, and then uh, it, it, it creates VM. So this is a perfect place where you can enable this confidential containers technology, right? Um, so Kata is, is part of this whole thing. And Confidential Containers is a project. Like uh, it, One of the aspects of Confidential Containers is, uh, yeah, it's a CNCF sandbox project right now. Uh, one aspect is to enable Kata to run confidential VMs. And the other aspect is uh, to enable this whole attestation flow that we saw. Um, and, and the main goal being like uh, enabling confidential compute for uh, cloud native applications. So yeah, before you see like how it's really done under under the hood, uh, let's let's look at this. I think like yeah, I, this yeah, you you all are pretty aware of this whole thing. Uh, like there is control plane and uh, there is worker node. Who who doesn't understand what's what's here? I don't think anybody. Yeah yeah, I think everybody understands here. Like what's this? So uh, so we'll we'll zoom in at the node level. Uh, th this is a typical like regular hardware. Kubelet gets the request, it sends to container D, which talks to run C, and then your Kubernetes pod comes up. But with Kata, the way it happens is like you have to have a hardware that has virtualization enabled. So you get the same request at Kubelet, Kubelet sends to container D, then to Kata runtime. But this time, instead of using the 
local technologies it will or using runc it will talk to kvm or whatever virtualization exists on that node uh, it will create a vm uh, linux guest and it uh, and and every kata machine has this uh, thing called kata agent uh, which acts like a init process for that vm and then kata runtime talks uh, to the kata agent to start uh, containers inside uh, which the image is pulled so snapshot is the pretty recent addition with container d1.7 uh, which enabled well, like, which which allows you to pull images on the on the host instead of uh, inside the guest so that you can do image sharing uh so but yeah depending on if you are using snapshot or not the images get uh, images get pulled and the uh, kubernetes pod starts so how does it look like with kata confidential compute right so the same thing you have kubelet container d kata runtime starts a vm virtual machine uh, there is kata agent but there is this before before images are pulled there is this other two components that come into picture the confidential data hub and attestation agent this is responsible for responsible for doing attestation so even before so in terms of kubernetes uh, any workload will start only after images are downloaded so if you put this whole thing before images are downloaded uh, the whole attestation piece of it uh, then you can you know then you can at that point you can decide whether to go forward or stop at that point so uh, yeah uh, so cdh talks to the relying party does the whole attestation process gets a key let's say if you are using uh, encrypted container images then you can block anybody from getting access to them because they don't have the key as in like you are you are protecting your protecting your ip uh, so yeah you use that key uh, to download the container images you decrypt them and then the the pod is started and at any point this this fails none of that will happen yeah a uh, moving ahead uh, so yeah drawbacks right like uh, there is there is perceived complexity with all this uh, but from i think from a developer's point of view uh, they they don't have to worry about the side the the uh, attestation piece of it because you can use sidecars init containers and all of that to abstract out the attestation logic um, so that can happen transparently yeah there is a complexity on the uh, sre side because they have to deploy the infrastructure that you saw on the on the right uh, but most of the cloud providers have that infrastructure deployed but then that kind of defeats the purpose if you don't want to trust the cloud provider then what's the yeah, you want to host it on your own own end so um yeah and then the boot time can increase because there is this extra network thing that you are doing before it comes up uh, depending on how the network is set up if there is some glitches on the network things can slow down but that's 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 minor and the performance overhead that i talked about right like there is like almost 10% uh, cost that you pay but i think like yeah for greater protection people who are really paranoid will you know uh, kind of accept the uh, uh, the drawbacks to some extent so uh, yeah today how do you use it with kubernetes it's uh, yeah using something called as Kube there is a operator that that uh, that can install qmu and all the required components on on each host then later it exposes itself as as a runtime class so you you start pod you change the runtime class with whatever that name is and then uh, yeah yeah okay so so i think i have only 5 minutes i'll jump to the demo quickly and i'll start this so i have this uh, demo like you, you uh, even even this recording is available later i'll post uh, you know uh, links to it and uh, you can access it so here i'm just showing like uh, the, okay so what's happening in this demo here what i'm doing is like uh, i have this assume that you are somebody who wants to uh, you know do ai inferencing so these models you don't want to be you know you want to use these models in a confidential environment so you'll encrypt these models deploy it somewhere where you can download it later and decrypt only after successful attestation so that's that's what we are doing, looking at here so uh, here I, i go into a bit of details of how 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 it's happening oh, hold on i'll move forward okay how do i it goes into details of how uh, yeah, then i deploy aks i mean you can deploy any kubernetes cluster uh, but it here it's showing that it's deployed and then uh, the kbs is also deployed uh, i think i'll, I'll so kbs is what we saw on the right right like which held the key which did all the attestation piece of it so in this case i am deploying it on the same kubernetes cluster it doesn't have to be 
Uh, it has to be somewhere you're sure that this is a safe environment because you're hosting keys for your uh, for your data. <laughs> but uh, yeah, for the demo purposes, it's on the same Kubernetes cluster. And then I deploy something called as uh, uh, a project called Cloud API Adapter, which is part of this whole uh, uh, Coco uh, pro project. Uh, here I'm doing the client side stuff where generating keys, encrypting the model. So this repo also has model uh, models uh, included. Uh, you can include your own model if you want. And uh, yeah, here here it, it encrypts the model, uploads it to the Azure storage. It can be I mean, any storage. It just has to be uh, like down. It could be downloaded from from within the Kubernetes cluster. That's the idea. And then uh, I deploy. Okay, here I'm just showing. Yeah. Okay. Here, here you can see like I have uh, uh, abstracted out the whole attestation process. Like uh, here you can see uh, I'm providing the the actual application is Triton server. It doesn't know anything about encryption or anything. It's uh, it's this init container that downloads. It does the attestation, downloads the key, downloads the model, decrypts the model, and makes it available for the underlying server to use. So in the end, once the models are available, the server is up. Uh, I'll, I'll, sh I'll directly jump to the, uh, yeah, the, uh, here the client is being used where I give it like a image and uh, it tells me like it's dog or cat. <laughs> uh, hold on. I think yeah, I'm almost out of time. So yeah. So here I run the Python client for the Triton server, and uh, it tells me whether it's a yeah like cat or whatever. So I, I guess yeah that's the demo. We'll we'll stop here. I'll jump to the uh, I'll jump. There, there's so much co more content I have uh, to cover here, but like I'm out of time. So I'll jump to uh, where is it? Takeaways. Right. So the first takeaway is like, yeah, uh, uh, confidential compute, remember encrypted memory. Confidential container is an effort to bring confidential compute to Kubernetes. Uh, Kata containers is the underlying runtime that's enabling this whole uh, project. And attestation is very important. Like without attestation, uh, none of this is useful. And uh, yeah, we didn't get to talk about this last piece, so uh, you can forget about it. Uh, yeah, that's image credits and uh, yeah. Uh, if you want to get involved, like this is this is the thing. Also, uh, yeah, these are some other talks around this same effort going on uh, at KubeCon, and so yeah. Questions, if I have time. Any questions? When I first when I first read the talk for the, or the title for this talk, I thought you were going to talk, I thought this was coming back around to clear containers, which I think was like where Kata containers went. How would you are you familiar with clear containers? Intel's project. It's been a while. Intel clear containers. Yeah, it's a neat it's a neat one. It overlaps a lot with what you're working on. It was an Intel one, but yeah. It's a neat one. I really like how you, how you presented this. Their containers was a similar thing, but it was. I think it became It did, yeah. Kind of like devolved into it. Yeah. But it was more about making sure the file system didn't change like before startup and that kind of stuff. Anybody else? Okay. Yeah. So uh, the, you refer to something kind of with a generalized term. I think it's a relying service, right? So what's the implementation of that relying service on like a generalized cloud service? Is it is like a, v, a virtualized TPM? Like who, who does that attestation to hand you those keys? 
Sorry, I didn't pick it. Well, like, so what? what's the implementation of a relying service? Like, how? It's, it's a general web service. It's, uh, it, knows, like, it knows how to uh, like, uh, decode the attestation, verify, like, it's really a uh, valid thing. And then it's a general web service. Okay. Would you say that Spire could be one of these? Right on. Thanks. Anybody else? Okay, thanks, Siraj, and 